Good, everybody. You know what time it is. Your boy Jeffrey L. Boney here for another hot edition of Real Talk Junkies Live. So excited to have you here on Real Talk Junkies today. As always, I want to encourage everybody to share the link and comment and chime in on the chat. We encourage your participation each and every uh, episode of Real Talk Junkies. We love to hear from you. We love to get your questions. We love to get your comments. We love to see you engaged. Also, I want to encourage everybody to go check out the website at forwardtimes.com. Again, that's forwardtimes.com. We're in the midst of Black History Month. And of course, we have a lot of information uh, and content on black history. It's important that we stay engaged, not only in the month of February, but also all year round. Uh, it's important that black history, especially what we are seeing with this uh, push to uh, stop uh, educational uh, importance uh, of our history being shared in curriculum and schools and places all across the country by people in the legislature and people in uh, positions of authority. It's important right now that we do that. And of course, I want to encourage you to check me out, JeffreyLBoney.com. Again, that's JeffreyLBoney.com. Pick up the latest book, Don't Argue With Me, A No-Nonsense Approach to the Issues in the Black Community. All right, let's jump right into it, y'all. Like I said, we're in the midst of Black History Month, and we want to definitely talk about the importance of history, particularly from a black perspective. Black History Month is uh, always celebrated uh, each February. And of course, it started off uh, with Black Hi uh, Negro History Week. Carter G. Woodson, uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, my frat brother, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, started uh, Negro History Week and it blossomed and grew into what we now celebrate as Black History Month. And so we got to know the origins of our history. And he did this, uh, or he created Negro History Week initially. And which blossomed into Black History Month as a means to never forget the major contributions of African Americans, people of African descent, not only uh, here in America, not only during slavery or post-slavery, but also prior to uh, us even being enslaved as a people, you know, uh, across the entire diaspora. Uh, black people, uh, people of African descent were kings and queens, and they had... Uh, many other professions, engineers and doctors, and they were very, very uh, profound in their industry and whatever it is that they did. And so uh, black history, African history, people of African descent, our history did not just begin uh, during slavery or uh, upon us being brought over here to the shores of, of, of America. And so I want to talk about some of that as well as the importance of incorporating all parts of our history, whether it be art, uh, culture, etc., uh, by asking my guest to join me on today, someone who is a historian in her own right, someone that I highly respect and I'm happy to have on Real Talk Junkies today. I'm talking about none other than Miss Akua Fayette. Let's give it up, y'all. Akua Fayette, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for being on Real Talk Junkies today. All right. All right, all right. So talk to us. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what you do. I'm from here. I'm from Fifth Ward, though. Okay, all right. So I already hit it. Fifth Ward, you know what I'm Third Ward. I'm Third Ward. Fifth Ward, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and we were there first. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Here we yeah. go. Oh, here we go. <laughs> but yeah, I was born in Fifth Ward, Texas. And matter of fact, I never heard it called that until one day I heard someone speaking from Wheatley. It was uh, I was at my children's high school and the lady says, I'm from Fifth Ward, Texas. I say, I like that. Yes, yes, yeah, like yes, that. yes, indeed. Yeah. So you went to uh, Wheatley High went School? Went to Wheatley, went to Eos, went to Crawford, yes. Eos Smith, and Wheatley. Yes, yes, yes. So so let's talk about, you know, I know you're a, a historian. Uh, you do a lot of different things. Of course. You're multi-talented. Uh, and so let's talk about, uh, we're in the midst of Black History Month. You heard some of the sh things mm -hmm. I shared earlier. Uh, and you hear about some of the things being done, like in Florida, here even in Texas, and across the country where a lot of these, uh, uh, these governors and these uh, legislators, these politicians, particularly on the uh, right side of the aisle, are seeking to uh, vilify the teachings of black history. Yeah. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know... I didn't get into uh, protesting until I was in my 40s, okay. which was a shock to my children. Mm -hmm. We just kind of like packed it up and said, y'all old enough to take care of yourself. We're going to hit the street, join them buff, and start looking into history and culture. But what really got me into it was that I grew up so differently. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was killed when I was 10. and uh, You said your father was my murdered father, when you was 10? No, he was killed. It was a, it was a situation that 
impacted my life. I'm the kind of person that no matter what I go through, I glean for the gold and the silver, mm -hmm. even as a kid. And uh, we were without a home at the time, and my father was killed. You know, I won't go into the details, but I'll say it like this. I said, when I grow up, I will never be homeless. I will never live with anybody in a way that I am not comfortable. And um, at 19, I talked to a realtor in selling me a house in, in South Park 50 some years ago. Mm. And never rented, you know, from that year of being married to now. Uh, because it impressed, it impressed upon me that there are things that you can do at home that you can't do nowhere else. Mm -hmm. And when you go live with someone, things can happen mm -hmm. out of your control and it's not your space. Mm -hmm. And so um, I said, I always want to have a place for my children to be safe and come home and know that everybody belongs here, is here, and if somebody come in, it's because we've allowed them to come in and you know, have the kind of control to be, you know, whatever. And so uh, that was one of the things. And so in doing that, my mother was heartbroken and didn't get the support that she needed and she started listening to the radio. She always did, but she started really tuning the channel and she heard this booming voice. It happened to have been a white man, but he was talking a lot of understanding of the Bible. You see, people will take the Bible and play with it to what they want it to be sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if you got any kind of intellect, you know that everybody got a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So you have to really read something, but you can't just read the Bible as it is. You have to go from, as they say, line upon line, precept upon mm -hmm. precept. So that means you got to figure it out, and it's not all in one spot. And so mothers start listening, and I like that kind of talking and intellect and I was 15 so we were one of the first groups that actually integrated a white church in Houston mm. they invited us in but when we went into the neighborhood we couldn't go outside and chit chat with the white people we kind of had to stay in because it wasn't legal to be integrated it was not legal not legal it hadn't been legal yet so 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 at this time mm -hmm. I'm just you know trying to get a historical perspective you're saying that you could go to the church, mingle with everybody inside. But outside, there were neighbors, and it wasn't legal. So, it, so it would what create some. What well, would you know, it's like when you're doing something that's not quite legal, people complain. And so, since they were leasing the 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 space that we were, the I W F Hall, matter of fact, over there near Third Ward, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want to have any problems because they were doing something that other folks weren't doing at the time, letting black people come in and sit with them. Although we had to sit in a certain spot, they kept it integrated inside as far as where we sat. We sat in the middle, in the center. Which was interesting. I met a lot of wonderful black people and, and I met some really nice white people. But when the integration became legal, some of them left. Not a lot, just a few. Some of who? The white people left mm -hmm. because now we could sit next to them. Wow. Taught me a valuable lesson. I don't think because we do things together that you really think that I'm equal with you. Yeah. It's until things change and you don't have control, that's where that came out. Let, let me ask you this, because uh, this is interesting that you're sharing this. Mm -hmm. What made you all want to be in the white church? Didn't want to be in the white church. It was the, the message that was coming from, the, actually it was a Judeo religion. Okay. It was the Sabbath. It was the holy days. It was no. It was all of the things that was written in the Bible, and that was the only place my mother could find it being taught. So you're saying that uh, mm -hmm. this was something that was appealing to her. Yes. It, it resonated with yes. her, and there were no black people teaching no, or because sharing she, she this listened in a way to him that, on the radio for like three or four years before we were even invited. Okay. So, oh, so you had to be invited. To you had to, well. It, I'm just saying, I mean... Yeah, because, you know, the, it was... But how did, how did the pastor or the ministry, the people in the ministry, that church, mm -hmm. know that she had an interest? Because there was a headquarters, Pasadena, California. Mm -hmm. They owned three college campuses. Okay. One in England, one in California, and one in Texas. Longview, Texas. Mm -hmm. Tyler, Texas, mm -hmm. that area. Mm -hmm. Ambassador College. Okay. And so we actually were writing in and having doing Bible study through correspondent course. They had correspondent Bible study. Because ah, he was okay. a radio minister, gotcha, really. Gotcha, gotcha. And he actually leased spaces in different places to have services. So so that that helps me understand. Yeah. Better, no, was it wasn't like it was a white church on the hill. We said, we want to go there. Yeah, no, that yeah, wasn't right, it. Right. <laughs> so, so, so she was writing and communicating. Yeah. Now, now, did she indicate in her writings, or you all indicate you were black? 
We didn't say we were black, but you know they always know. <laughs> come on now. I'm just saying. I mean, I'm them just... codes. You know. You, uh, you yeah. know. Come on. Yeah, come there, on. there really was none of them living in Fifth Ward as I know right. of back then. So, so, so. Even with that, mm -hmm. they uh, were open. Yeah. To allow they were now, nice. now were they open? I just this is a question. Were they open to allowing you all to attend the church because they wanted contributors like tithers? my mother was a widow. She didn't. They they actually boosted her income. They gave her a check every month. It's called widow's tithe. We didn't know that. Really? Oh yeah. Even even as a black woman. Yes. Now I'm sure her. Her, the amount she received wasn't as much as maybe the white widows, you know, we kind of figured that out. But mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that was really honorable that they obeyed that law of taking care of the widows. So so she was being uh, cared for as a widow, uh, as a black... Subsidized. Subsidized mm -hmm. as an as African-American female widow. But uh, you still were uh, segregated within the church. Within the church as far as where we sat. Now, we could meet with people at their homes and talk to them. They were some really friendly ones. But But... but from the optics, yeah, uh, they wanted you all to be optically segregated because they didn't want to be impacted by way of being able to lease that spot in the church. Yeah, or if something should come up because, you know, people were still getting hung and things were still happening along the way, remember. You now, know, what years are we talking about? We're here? talking about the, the middle 60s. Okay, the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you all were at this church. Now, did you feel some kind of way being, I mean, you already knew the elephant in the room. Y'all are black. Mm -hmm. They're white. Mm -hmm. what, what were you, how old were you at this time? I was 15. So how, how were you feeling? I mean, did you, were you cognizant of the, the racism in the country at that time and, and the evil? And okay, but you stuff? got to remember, we're in Houston, Texas. Okay. And in Houston, we had our communities. Okay. Uh, black people were living with black people, and I wasn't even looking to want to be with white people. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't the desire. Um, I just liked the philosophy from the Bible that I was getting and the understanding of how to live, you know, through that system. And um, I was like 13 when she first started doing the correspondent course. And I did a paper. Matter of fact, I was the first black to win an uh, essay in, in Houston or Texas for the law association. They had a contest every year, but blacks couldn't participate until segregation, I mean, uh, integration was in. And uh, I was able to file in that first year that they opened it up to blacks. And before, they always had first, second, and third place. But when blacks came into it, they didn't have a place. They had three winners. Mm. I was on channel 13, because I, you know, I was one of the winners, and they had two other white kids was up there to have won that contest. And I was always doing a little writing and stuff like that, but you didn't have people back there to encourage you. That's why I learned from what I've seen people do. I encourage children who can write. I encourage children who can draw, and even if they think they can. I used to tell everybody, you got art in you. You just got to find it, and it comes in different ways. And so um, I just like to be able to discuss and see things, and I have always been a solution-oriented person. And I remember quietly telling my mother, because uh, she was very sad about my father's death. And when I say this, I've learned, I've got to explain it, because it's a little deeper than some people can get from just the statement. But I was 10, and I said to her, I said, some people have to die in order for some people to live. Mm. And I talked to my husband about that, and when we were, you know, engaged in all that, we talked a lot. And I said, look, don't stand in anybody's way when they're trying to do something that God has intended them to do. Because you will be moved one way or the other. It may not be death, it could be sickness, it could be going to another country, it could be whatever. And so we both made that vow that if one of us wanted to really do something, that because he was of the same faith and uh, at the time, but I stayed there long enough to really check everything out, but it was the best place for me to be because I can go anywhere around any white people and they just don't even intimidate me and I'm not you know and I had to tell some of them in the church look you don't have to make jokes every time we get together because we're black talk to me like you talk to everybody else because I'm explain doing. what you mean you know how some people think that when you have a black friend they gotta say things like you know you want some chicken or some watermelon you know they want to say something or something that says I know black people because mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know my husband was from Alabama didn't like watermelon mm -hmm. you don't know black people we are people and we have all differences and everything so it was, it's been it's been interesting. I, I'm I'm fascinated with this this story because I'm just trying to to to, to 
picture myself being a, a fly on the wall and kind of hearing and seeing, you know, this 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 internal segregation yeah. inside the church. And, and you know, there's an emphasis. It has some interesting stuff. Yeah, I mean, but there, there's it's just fascinating to me only because, you know, I, I've I've written I've written articles and pieces and I've studied. Uh, you know, religion a lot uh, over the course of my many years. Even when I went to the University of Oklahoma, I studied a lot of different religious things. But then I, 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 I studied this this uh, phenomenon, which was adopted by the Ku Klux Klan, as a matter of fact, uh, called Christian ideology. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and it was based off of the fact that they believed that uh, per the Bible and per religion that they are the superior race. Yeah. And that uh, you know anyone uh, darker hue, mm -hmm. uh, like black people, are cursed. And they use scriptures mm -hmm. uh, like uh, the Ham and, and, yeah. and, 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 and Abraham and all of that type of stuff, and and all of these different scriptures to justify mm -hmm. uh, their superiority and our inferiority and how we're cursed. Yeah. And uh, you know you can also add on to the fact that how they use the Bible to justify. The, the enslavement oh, yes. of oh, black yes. people oh, yes. or people of African descent as well. So uh, I, I guess what's fascinating to me is just the fact that you all, A, uh, during the height of uh, mm -hmm. or the middle of the civil mm -hmm. rights struggle and uh, Jim Crow and all of these different mm -hmm. things that you all voluntarily well, and uh, the about chose it. to go to a white church and, yeah. and, and subject yourself in essence to an internal segregation inside the church which is supposed to be inclusive of everybody. Right. But you know what? It didn't come off that way. It never comes off that way because, like I said, inside, everybody was friendly. But like I said, if you are doing something that's not totally legal, there is a certain amount of uncomfort in it. But you know what really got me along the way? You, you listen because I'm always listening. Like I tell people, I, if I'm somewhere, I'm there 100%. I won't miss a day. won't mm -hmm. be late. Mm -hmm. But if I be late... If I start being late, which I probably won't, I'll just probably stop. I've already made an assessment, and I don't walk, I tell make my assessment. So after that, after having been in that church for, my mother uh, passed after she'd been there like 21 years. So when mother passed, I was really on the verge then of seeing some things don't change. Because just like inside of the United States, you know, we're in this, this country and segregated, and we don't jump off the cliff and leave. You mm -hmm. deal with it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, this is supposed to be of God. And I finally came to the conclusion that if God was a racist, that I wanted to go to hell. Mm. And I decided that we're going to open this up. I started going to Texas Southern, to Ty City. I started going to the shrine, reading about all the history and the culture. For those that are watching, they, they may not know <laughs> what the shrine They may not know the deal is. is. The Shrine so, of the Black Madonna. Okay. It used to be you know, really just a big place to go to get our history and our culture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I didn't ever join, but they used to call me an honorary member because I was there often, mm -hmm. you know. And, and one of the reasons why I wouldn't join them because they did Christmas and I don't, you know, it was like I was, I know scriptures that talk about Christmas is not necessarily what you worship. And I'm okay with it now for people who want to do it, but that wasn't something that I wanted to do and didn't have any great Christmases anyway mm -hmm. when I was a kid being mm -hmm. coming up, you know, like we came up. But what I decided to do was uh, before I leave this church, I'm going to confront the minister and we need a conversation. So we had a conversation. I say, first of all, I've noticed in the, in the children Bible stories, it's racist. He said, well, how do you see that? I say, because they have all the evil people, dark. He said, it's not even a colored book. It's black and white. I said, yeah, but you know how to shade. And I want you to go back and read every story where the bad people are standing. They all got black hair, black beards. Where the good people are standing, it's kind of lightly faded out into a light. I say, we know the difference. Mm -hmm. And once he went through it, he went to the University of Houston to take a course on race, but he couldn't change the church because it really comes from way up, you know, from California and mm -hmm. so forth. But it eventually began to tumble down because when that started coming out, it's people start becoming uncomfortable, you know. And uh, so I put on the first black history program that that church ever had, and it was like about 70 years old. Mm -hmm. And the first one I did was one that I actually dreamt a dream three days before the event. And I have it on video. I was about 30 some years old. Mm -hmm. And it was the name of it was the boy who had a tail. Mm. And it's really explaining to them and to everybody, you are who you think you are. And you are who you allow people to tell you who you are. 
And as it goes through the story about how this boy discovered that he was a prince, that he come from royalty, mm -hmm. and that, you know, and actually, you know, there was a statement not too long ago about somebody was calling somebody a uh, monkey or ape, and I said, you know, we need to stop getting, and it, it disrupted the inter, uh, the election period. When this lady called somebody, uh, said somebody was a monkey or something, I said, hey, you know what, people are playing with us because we know that we're not monkeys. And now you go, now you can Google, you know, mm -hmm. you don't even need to buy, but like, you know, Google, just Google it. Mm -hmm. Go Google monkey and see where monkey came from. Mm -hmm. Didn't come from our imagination of what people do with monkeys. It was someone else. And when you look at all the varieties of monkeys, they look far less like us. So I said, why do we let people take things and taunt us when they're really, it's really embarrassing the monkey the way we act as human beings sometimes. So what I do with the goose and stories, I take the geese and they tell the story of what people act like. Mm -hmm. And I got the idea of goose sense from the first black caucus convention because when I left that church, I went straight into politics, but I didn't know nothing about politics because guess what? People basically in that church didn't vote. And when I came out of it, I was shocked to know that churches who get money from the government can kind of have people in a position where they don't vote. I mean, that's like a oxymoron. Mm -hmm. And you get up and say, well, we want to pray about something that's happening in the city. And I'm thinking, go vote. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first thing that I did. And when I went there, there was a minister that was preaching about if only black people had the sense of a goose. And I said, well, I think everybody needs the sense of a goose. So I started studying geese and came up with the idea of using them. At the time I did the first story, I didn't even know about the goose, but I put that into the goose and stir because I teach on wisdom and history and culture. And I say, we all need to know about goose sense. And it's really fascinating. And so when I do the story and I'm taking the one is for the, uh, the past, one is for the present, and one is for the future, and other one have other positions and there are five major characters. But I told that story in a, in a hotel in New Orleans to eight black children who were doing uh, um, they were doing a, I went to get like a little a fashion show and their parents hired me to do that. And there were 30 something white people at the bar. When I got through with that story, went to my art table, they came to my table. Some had tears in their eyes. Cause he said, they never heard anybody explain racism the way that I did. I say, when I explain racism, I let people, white people know, I'm not blaming you. I know you weren't even born, but you're responsible. And we're all responsible to make it right. Mm. And I've had white kids write me letters and say, come visit my home, talk to my parents. When I used to go around and do free stories at the library, and then I start, you know, doing them at the schools being paid. I had one lady, took her two years, a Jewish lady took her two years to get me out to Austin to do my storytelling at a white school. And they really didn't want me to come because it took her two years, but she said, you've got to hear her. And I, you know, they always have one or two classes that are storytelling because you want to be comfortable with the children. They took the whole school and put it in the cafeteria for me to do a story to. Mm. So, but I did it, so, and they were quiet. So, so we're in the midst of Black History Month, mm -hmm. and I mentioned earlier there is an attack on uh, our history. Yes, uh, of being uh, told uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not all ugly. No, it's not all bad. There are some great and good things, but. We can't ignore the ugly things. No, it's got to all be told. And we can't ignore the bad things. But there's this, uh, and they're starting to use these these buzzwords and phrases, woke, woke. They they they're flipping the wokeness and and and, and basically woke equal black. You know, if mm -hmm. you look at it, they're they're using it in a way that that you only can talk about when you talk about wokeness or woke. Mm -hmm. You talk about black people. That's mm -hmm. what you're talking about. So. In that you were able to experience uh, subtle uh, and blatant racism, mm -hmm. even in the church, mm -hmm. uh, segregationists, and you got these people, like you just said, that you tell them, I'm not blaming you for the direct actions of your ancestors, but you're responsible. Yeah, to make but, it right. But, but, but many people don't believe that they're responsible and they don't want to feel guilty for the sins of the, the mm -hmm. father mm -hmm. or their mothers mm -hmm. or their grandfathers and great grandfathers and great grandmothers. So how do you believe we should address as a people, black people, what's going on? Because it's, it's, it's in our face, yeah. real time, in what they're seeking to do to try to stop 
their children and, and children's children that's coming up from learning about what the evils of their, their forefathers? Well, you go through life learning and beating your head against the wall and know that it doesn't help. First, you have to stop and go into yourself. That, I mean, seriously, as black people, we've got to go into ourselves and first love ourselves because a lot of us are hating on ourselves. And if you're hating on yourself, you are vibrating hate. And you're going to meet people that hate. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. I, I, I've tried this several times. I leave the house with an attitude of something good, meet good people all day. Leave out with an attitude with something else, you meet people ready to deal with you. Mm -hmm. So I've learned you give off a vibration. It's almost like when you say, they better not ask me today because I know what I'm going to tell them. They don't even ask you. Mm -hmm. They can feel the vibration that you know. And not to, you know, we're not going to go with you today because you read it. People like to catch you off guard. And what I'm really hoping for our people is just to learn to go into ourselves and make an assessment. Whatever's been done that's wrong, it's up to us to go inside and to make it right. But sometimes we repeat it because let me tell you, I wrote this book. I, I, I uh, dreamt the book and wrote it out in a big tablet 25, 26 years ago. I wrote the book and did the service all over Houston in different places they would send me. But I was going to get the book published. I said, I'm going to get a black publishing company, 100 year old black publishing company. That's what I want because I was just trying to do all black. That didn't work out. And I keep my paperwork so nobody couldn't use what I had because I knew what I had sent. But I was going to Walt Disney for two years in a row and was going to take the books. And they said they would give me 500 if I would just go on. But I hadn't seen what they'd done with my story. Well, when I looked at, I said, well, you got to show me what you're doing with the book, first of all. And I didn't believe you're going to give me just 500 free copies without any paperwork, without any whatever. So let's see what's going on. And when I did, that's when the Internet had just come out. So they sent me um, uh, on the Internet an email and I was reading my script, they added five characters to my book. And a little script to my book without even asking me. Now they was telling me, we're gonna call you every time we may. I said, well, no, you gotta do a lot of stuff, but you know, you don't do that to an author's book. But they took out the part where I started talking about how this country was won, stole, however you wanna call it, mm -hmm. was taken from the American natives. And that when people do good for people and people turn around and do evil for them, that's the example that's been set. And I did it in a nice way, but I told the truth in the book. Because that's what I do the book for, to, to tell the truth. Because I couldn't get history in school when I was in school, the kind of history I got at the shrine. And uh, they weren't to take it out. I said, I'm not taking it out. And you know, and you can't add no characters in my book. Because then if you do, you will take your characters and start your own goose and series. And I'm not, no, we're not doing that. So I didn't do it. I set that book down for 20 years. And I know God preserved it. Started doing it all over again two years ago. This time it was a hundred year old white publishing company. And uh, they messed up, so I, I, I said, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. So I, another company, long story short, I've learned something about publishing companies and I'm getting ready to put some stuff out to help people who are self-publishing so they'll know how to do and how to get around the internet. Because being an older person, it's a lot about the internet we don't understand and they're ripping off seniors like crazy. Start recording everything you say to people over the phone when you're doing business because if you're doing it by the internet and you're signing on to the internet, when it goes, you don't know who's rechanging stuff and what comes back. You don't know. Mm -hmm. So if you snap, you know, just picture of everything and all that to keep that together. But what I'm trying to say is this. It is, I got 100 copies from this company of the book and they had nine blank pages in there. And I said, this is not right. It's supposed to have some cloud pictures in there. But... Uh, the other pictures, you know, and I knew that when I, because when I went to do the audio of this book, I could see the guy on the other side of the screen, the white guy looking at me like, what? Because the first one I tell is about ancient Egypt and how they came and took from us and how they brought us here. You know, it, the, it's in the story. And uh, so then when I went to the, I'm doing three stories per book because I want to give extra. So I did the next one, which is called The Boy Who Had a Tail. So he was a little bit better, but then I did another one that I do a historical one that I'm doing from people that we have done things in this country with, I'm, I, like even in Houston or whatever. And um, when he came from behind the audio booth, I said, I could see you were a little disturbed by the story. And he kind of smiled. I said, but you know, you know, it's the truth and it's what I'm, you know, that's what I do this for. I said, but 
I'm not blaming you if, if you listen to the story, but we're all responsible and you're responsible if you're living off of the wealth of something that was taken from another people. And the least you need to do is not put stumbling blocks in their way, even if you don't do anything else for us. Mm -hmm. and the, but we've got to start doing that for ourselves, yeah. Jeffrey. Yeah, we do. Uh, and, and so I know that you're heavily into art. Yes. Uh, and Symbolic. Symbolic art. Well, what's, explain. When I came into Third Ward, I wanted to do remodeling. I like design. My husband and I did a house at Project Row. We, you know, another guy helped us get the money and we donated it. Vaulted the ceilings and tiled the floors and all these artists coming in and out. And I hadn't painted, I painted a few pictures when I was in my late 20s, pregnant with my last daughter. And I thought, I might need to take up painting. And then I got into the hair and all that in the, in the, in the skin and all that, the beauty of blackness. And I said, I think I'll do a few little things. And so I started doing some, some artwork. But it's really to show us I decided I wouldn't do faces, just black. I mean, I mean black. But the way that I dressed them, everybody knew that it had a statement that this is black, but this ain't no any black. My books are a litmus test for racism. I only have, you know, I've had a few white people to really come to me to buy them, but I have some good, you know, white people. But I wasn't even aiming for them. I was wanting to really teach our people, our children to be proud. But the white kids started getting it and going, wait a minute, I need to go talk to my mom and my daddy. Because kids don't come here, you know, wanting to hate on each other. But they're told at a certain age, you can't be there, you can't go there, you can't do that. And so that's what I used the, I said, if, if, a, if a picture can say a thousand words, what if I painted a thousand words in a picture? Mm -hmm. So every piece of painting I have have a story around them. And what I didn't know as time went on, my work, actually my art started being prophetic. I've got pieces that there's, that things have happened after I painted before it happened. Mm -hmm. And um, Like give me an example. Okay, one is, this is the, the best one because it was really weird. I painted three little girls with socks with lace and black shoes and I, never, I always did the African stuff. I don't know why I painted them, but the plate was smoky background, gray smoky background. And when I got through painting it, I said, I don't know, this is, why did I put these kids on this dark plate? So I put the plate in the back room because I wasn't going to sell it. Five years later, I met the undertaker that took care of three little black girls who died in smoke inhalation. And when I saw the picture of them, I knew the plate had the girls in the same order in which they were in age like five, four. And I used to, people don't know this, I used to go to places where children had died or whatever, and I would take a piece of art to the family at the funeral. I just would leave it with them. I ain't want nobody to know that I did it. And they had some kids that got beat up and burned over off of, uh, uh, way off a of telephone or car road one time, and they had uh, stuff out there, and we would go out there, and you know, we just, just to give honor to the kid's memory. And when I went there with this, this plate, the mother was there. She would, because you know she had left the kids there, and they, they uh, the candle went out and something caught fire, but they were smoke. But the undertaker, the lady who told me, she said those babies were well taken care of. They didn't have a scar on their body, so I knew what had happened. This lady had made a horrible mistake. She had left to go out to eat, left the kids in bed, and they died. But I thought the unfairness of it was that people would want her to go to prison when that was a perfect opportunity to make her go around and tell people the danger of leaving your children at home. She couldn't have any more children. She lost three babies. Do you need any more punishment than that? Mm -hmm. And I even wrote a letter in, in that defense and sent it to a newspaper. They wouldn't, they wouldn't touch it. And that's when I became disillusioned with, how can we stand up for each other? We have mental illnesses that have gone down through our people. And we have problems. But how many parents haven't done something where maybe their kid could have died when they went to go get some chicken in the backyard off the barbecue pit or did something else, hanging close on the line, left the baby in the house? I mean, but she wouldn't. She made a horrible mistake. And I think she should have had a certain amount of, um, what I say, she should have had a certain amount of punishment, but the punishment was already there when she lost the babies. Mm -hmm. Be compassionate. That will be the best person to help other people know don't leave your babies anywhere. 
by themselves and you know just that kind of thing mm. so I, I I work with young women who are pregnant and I tell them how to talk to their babies don't worry about the daddy take care of them after the baby get here and we just have a lot to do to build our people to get the things done that needs to be done and why we don't have the businesses that we need to have and the cooperation of those that come out of the prison system they're not throwaway people but I think you I think that you know kind of going back to your experience mm -hmm. in the 60s, you know, I think that, you know, and I talk about this in my book and I talk about this often, regularly, uh, you, you mentioned, you kept using the word because that was the word that it was called at the time, integration. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't call, I don't believe it was integration. I believe, and, and your, your story is an example of the fact that it wasn't no. integration. No. It was desegregation mm -hmm. because if it was truly integration, uh, those individuals that you said once it was quote unquote integration, mm -hmm. they left the church. Yeah, there were a few that Because did. now you all were. Uh, we had more rights than they wanted us to have. Right. You know, they, they had their limit. It was good limit. when you were. Yeah, yeah. It was good when, yeah. you know, you still had some level of, of, of accountability mm -hmm. to the law of being subservient to, to them, mm -hmm. being inferior. To them, they still had the power mm -hmm. to, uh, they're allowing you to be in their presence, allowing you to be in their space. And I, and I say all that to say that you, you mentioned a lot of the things that we're dealing with as yeah. a community, as a people. But I really do blame who I call the beneficiaries of the civil rights struggle who dropped the ball for generations, at least two or three generations uh, since the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act was passed, 64, 65. You know, they sought to get the validation, the approval, the acceptance, and be around uh, a people collectively who didn't want to be around them uh, collectively. I mean, I'm not saying all, um, but I'm saying the majority. Wow. There was white flight, people leaving various oh, communities because black people were now starting to move in. You talked about South Park earlier. South Park was predominantly white. Yeah. You know, and, and then they end up leaving. South Park to go to various other places across uh, the, uh, the, the the greater Houston area, Missouri City. Uh, white people moved out to Missouri City, yeah. and then black folks followed them out there. And it's like white folks don't leave it out there. You, I did a, I did a U-turn from Missouri City when we lived in South Park. We lived there five years, and the house was broken into. But we knew who broke into it. The guy next door knew we were going to the Feast of Tabernacle. We'd be gone for eight days, and so you know. But uh, the thing about it was is that. We moved into uh, Missouri, well, not Missouri City, about Hiram Clark area, which is right below Missouri City. We had all white neighbors. And uh, I think I was sent there for a reason. Met a white lady from New York, the one who started me painting. And I painted five pictures, and then she didn't want me to paint anymore because I could paint too fast and could paint. I'm, I could copy better than anything because I have an eye for detail. So I do a picture so fast, she couldn't make the money off of me. So she was kind of like, well, you don't need to do any that. So I put the paints away for 20 years until I went to Project Grow House. And then I picked up the paintbrush and started doing stuff like that. But we just had this feeling of uh, when we moved to from from Hiram Clark, we stayed there five years. I flipped my first house before I didn't know what flipping was. Mm -hmm. Looked at it, thought about what people would like, did it. First person walked in, bought it, doubled our money. See, I should have been in the real estate, mm -hmm. passed that opportunity up. And we moved to Garden Villas. Now, this is a place where, you know where Garden Villas is? Mm -hmm. You know my reason for moving there? Mm -hmm. I wanted space, but when my kids came home from school, I wanted them to be with the family, and I really wasn't interested with them playing with the kids next door and all of that kind of stuff that goes on in neighborhoods. And so uh, that's where they kind of grew up. And one day I saw this white guy coming down the street because we had started doing remodeling. We was all over the place doing it. And I said, well, no, let me see. And I was like, what are you? I said, okay. From that moment, I said, I got to go. I said, they've got houses that are being destroyed in South Park. We could get for a little of nothing. And the, the, the kind of like the recession was there because the oil business was going down and it was really rough. And people in my husband's job had lost their jobs. He did too, lost their homes, their cars, their people divorcing. But I had a little wallpaper design business and he came to work with me and we made that work to keep everything going. But it was rough. 
I said, we don't have to struggle like this to live out here. We can go get a house in South Park. I said, I know black people. Love black people. And one thing I know about us, you don't mess with me, I don't mess with you. And there's a certain amount of respect that we can have, even in an area where we're all kind of connected. And so uh, that's what we did. We moved back. And my hope was to make a big difference. And I'm getting ready to start back to where I, I came to Third Ward and got lost. Because nobody does nothing for South Park. So, but I learned. Learn people, learn things, and could make a difference. And there's some, something special that I do want to do before I leave this world for that area. But yeah, it's a food desert. Uh, we got some issues. But if you. But that's what I'm trying to say, though, Akua, mm -hmm. that a lot of the things that we're currently dealing with or seeing, I believe, were self inflicted. Because we had. All of the stuff that you're talking about. We had stores and, and we had businesses and we had this collective unity that was lost because of this so-called integration, which is actually desegregation. Everybody wanting to be validated by those that did not look like them. And I think that, uh, we, you know, you mentioned on the phone, we were talking uh, the other day about the various organizations in our community. Mm -hmm and how a lot of them have uh, fallen by the wayside or not living up to the standards of, of why they were uh, originally created. Uh, and a lot of us uh, out here ego tripping and who getting the credit and all of this yeah. type of stuff as opposed to the, to, the, to the work. And there's so many issues out here, man. It's, it's like, it's, what's it's that saying? Or how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? One bite at a time. But it's like, okay, well, who's willing to take a chunk out of this part of the elephant. And it's who's, called unity. It's, it's collective and, 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 unity. Collective responsibility, Jake yes. says that. We, it's the, it's, you have to, and I, I gotta throw this in, cause you know, I'm doing this uh, exhibit on the 18th of February at the Artist Collective, Michelle Barnes. And I teach a little class twice a week. It will start out as a favor, but now it's one of the best things that I could have done because it's connected me with young kids as to how they think now. And they do think a little differently. Oh. But I've also been learning different things. I pulled away from the movement. And when I first came out here, they were calling it a struggle. I don't like negativity even back then. I said, I'm not going to call it a struggle. I'm going to call it the movement because we got to move. So we worked and did the, we were the ones that orchestrated and did the in buff house and taught people how to remodel. And, you know, they, they, they helped us a little bit, but we did For those that stuff. don't know, what does in buff stand for? The National Black United Front. All right, I just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I don't like doing that because people don't know yeah. acronyms and things like that. But yeah, so it was like you you got to get in there and do something. But once something kind of get where it's not really moving, I got to go mm -hmm. because it's something inside of me. Even as a kid, I mean, like I said, I was you know doing stuff at eight years old, making a little money in people's houses and shining shoes with furniture all and doing different things. And so it's like. I really, and I wanted to be a fashion designer. I used to make clothes. My sister used to wear them to nightclubs when she sang. It's just stuff that I wanted to do. And I have bypassed it because I don't like to be the person at the top. But I like to work with the person at the top. But what I'm finding out with us, when you had a lot of people at the top don't like to work with nobody because they think they're trying to take their position or they're trying to, you know, tell them what to do or trying to find. And you're just not going to tell me everything and I'm going to listen and not ask questions. Mm -hmm. And so when I go in an organization, I've been on a number of boards. And when I get on a board, you know I've been there. Mm -hmm. You know, I was one board with an organization who was sending people out to do, and the guy was talking, putting people on buses to send them to protest and stuff like that. Um, everybody needs to get on the bus sometime and protest. Don't just have a group of people you think should get on the bus and protest. Everybody benefits from it. Everybody should take turns like they did the busing thing when nobody would ride the bus. Mm -hmm. We could get things done, but now we don't have patience to stick with it. You know, if you protest, one day protest doesn't hurt a company. You got to be ready to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And there are lessons and things that we are not even even thinking about because our kids don't know about sacrifice. So we got to be willing to sacrifice. But first of all, if we go into ourselves and really find who we are and, and the God and the I am in us and who we really are, we could come out, we wouldn't even need to worry about them because there are enough of us. And there's enough money within our realm to do whatever we want to do. And, and, and in a perfect world, you know, you're right. And the, the sad reality, however, is that, again, we, we were forced to have to do business with each other, to have to live amongst each mm -hmm. other, to, 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 to talk to each other. 
uh, we were all a part of the same struggle slash movement, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, during that time. Uh, and once we got this so-called integration, uh, <laughs> which was desegregation in itself, it's like we felt like we was equal to them, mm -hmm. on, but it was only uh, on paper. It wasn't uh, from a resource mm -hmm. standpoint. And so I hear you when you say we need to look within ourselves, but some of us were not taught to look within ourselves no. and have that type of pride and, and self-awareness and uh, self-love because I believe that the ball was dropped. And so the, the same attention to the needs of our people and the collective unity, uh, even if it's a remnant of people, it just kind of started to fail, uh, fall away, and which is why you start seeing uh, gangs being formed in our communities because a lot of those younger people were looking for love, looking Family. for unity, looking for guidance. Mm -hmm. And so they was like, well, I'm not getting this from my parents or from the community leaders. So I got to figure this thing out on my own. The same thing with the Black Lives Matter movement. We have uh, NAACP and various other organizations that were created. But those young people was like, you know what? I, we're getting killed. We're getting uh, brutalized. Police brutality and all this stuff happening. Trayvon Martin was killed and his killer was get, uh, gotten off George Zimmerman enough is enough we got to stand up and do something and so i guess what i'm saying is you have a a, a breakdown a chasm mm -hmm. that exists between those uh like yourself who grew up during the time of the civil rights movement versus those that have no idea yeah, what it was like. about what yeah. the, the the fight was like the advocacy the, the getting on the bus to doing the city is to all of the stuff that was being done and they, they're just saying to themselves, I don't know what the hell is going on mm -hmm. around me, but I don't like it. Yeah. And, I, and, and I, I don't know how to fix it. And so let me try to figure this thing out on my own because I didn't try to go to the leaders and they ain't giving me no answers that are sufficient for me because we're still getting brutalized. We're still being killed. We still have a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with. So I guess that's what I'm trying to get us to as to, yeah, it's great to say that we need to have self-love, but what if I don't know how to find no, that? No, what if I don't feel that? See, it's not just saying it when I say that because that's part of the solution, but the biggest solution is going to be those of us who know how to do it mm -hmm. should latch on to those who don't. And how do we do that? We do that by, like, for myself. I have a number of little young people ask me what they want to be, you know, me to mentor them. Mm -hmm. And so I spend time talking to them, but what I have done, I have hijacked art. I don't go in there just teaching them how to paint. I say this is the art of listening. The art of uh, silence, the art of seeing, and I am teaching them different things. So this is what I want to say. I have a five-year-old class, and, the, and this uh, Asian guy came and said, we got a contest going on, and it's, they really want these kids to paint something that mimics strength. Now, how do you think you're going to get that over to a five-year-old? I want you to paint a picture showing strength. And I'm thinking, okay, they're going to do muscles. Or what are they going to do? Surprise me. I guess some of the work has helped. I say, well, what do y'all see as strength? One kid say, my mama. Mm. One says, my grandmama and my aunt. One says, my mama and my daddy. So I got the art project already rolling. Because that's what I teach. Unity. Everybody getting together is one. In a circle. Because in a circle, there's no top, no bottom, no nothing. Because when you start putting long tables and all those kind of things together, somebody thinking, because I'm at this end, I'm by myself, I'm over it, or I'm better, or whatever. You do the circle and everybody touching and giving and sharing. So what you're saying is you're using your talent, your yes. gift, uh, to incorporate uh, something that is needed. Wisdom, to, to, history. To incorporate that into to like using the art and, and, and merging in uh, this, this, like you say, wisdom, art, or, or self love, self awareness, yes. and respect. And respect, and, and these are five year olds. Yes, and so. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I go to, I, when I was in banking, uh, I, ha I had to finance a couple of uh, projects uh, as, a, as a banker. One of them uh, was uh, over off of uh, Stancliffe Street uh, in the 59 in the Beltway. Uh, it was the uh, Arabic uh, Cultural Center, Arabic uh, American Cultural Center. And I, I bring them up because uh, I went inside the, their uh, facility 
They were in there teaching their young kids uh, Arabic. Mm -hmm. They were teaching their young kids. I'm talking about, you know, real young, like you say, five, mm -hmm. yeah. six years that's old. When, that's the best time. They were teaching them about their history, some of the key figures uh, in their history. They talk about their family. They could go back generations of where they come from. Uh, they was reading historical books, and, and it was just so beautiful to see yeah. that uh, these uh not only young, I mean, these older individuals, but also teenagers were passing the information along and spending time in the same with the Jewish Community Center. Uh, they were teaching them yeah. about what happened, including the Holocaust. Oh, yeah. They're, gonna uh, really, they're not going to get rid of that. Right. And, 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 and they talked about uh, all those things. They were reading from the Torah uh, and, 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 and talking about their, their Jewish faith and heritage and, and religion and and all of these things they embraced. And these are young, young kids yeah. uh, holding on to the various traditions, not only the holy holiday traditions that they had, but also, you know, uh, when you turn a certain age, they mm -hmm. have what's called a bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah and yeah. different other things. So all of these things were embraced. In a, but, but then we look at ourselves. We can't even get Kwanzaa together. I mean, we say we want something of our own because, you know, and the minute that other people take over, like I was talking to you about, the minute other people take over, we'll complain. But what are we doing? Mm -hmm. But we're going to have to change that. We're going to have to change Just that. like a Juneteenth. you got some of these corporations and people and entities who now that it's a federal holiday uh, are looking to, I don't want to call it hijack, but they're looking to make money off of it yeah. and, and, and capitalize yeah, on, on it from a monetization standpoint. I can't be mad at them or whatever, but where was this passion and love well, collectively? It's all about money. For, 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 for Juneteenth before. You had some people who even us would make jokes about it like, why would I celebrate finding out something two years late? Well, you know, my take on it was uh, we were free before we ever got on the boat, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. But we called them slaves. They weren't slaves until mm -hmm. they got over here. They were enslaved. enslaved so right. I had learned not to call them call our people slaves. They were enslaved. Absolutely. But going back to what that being in that white church did for me, I ended up in River Oaks, in the richest church in River Oaks, in a meeting with a hundred some white women, the only one in there. Went to dinner with them at different houses. Of course, I was the elephant in the room. And one day they forgot I was in there. And they started talking about Oprah Winfrey. And they say, Oprah's too rich. She's trying to teach people. And after a while, one of them looked over and saw me. And I could tell because her face changed. And then she started like, uh, uh, you know one thing about Oprah? She really does help the, you know, she yeah, took that conversation. I got so tickled. So what I did, I learned something. If you ever want to say something that might not be too great, especially be the last one to speak. <laughs> so there are 90 some women in there in this one house on Chevy Chase. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting, you know, some of us sit on the floor and I'm sitting at the back. But I knew I wanted to say something. Been in that white church made me able to just stand up with white folks and talk. And don't even think about it. they're white because I don't look at them up. I look at them. My mother taught me nobody's better than you and you're better than nobody. So when I go in a place, everybody's even as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So it ain't about color. But I got up to the front and I was the last one to speak. I said, I spent 40 years of my life taking care of white people. I said, I'm going to spend the next 40 years taking care of black folks. I said, I'm not doing the things that I used to do. And not that I'm against you all. I said, but my purpose is to help my people. So when I moved in that black neighborhood, I had black folks stop talking to me because you moved into South Park, like, well, you're not really, you know, you're not, oh, yeah. You're not oh, really yeah. what? You're not really up there with us if you're living in South Park. Uh. But see, I live in my head. That's how I could get on a train at 18, go into Mobile, Alabama, in the middle of the civil rights movement to marry my black husband, mm -hmm. to be. Because mm -hmm. I live in my head. I know anywhere I am, I'll be okay, as long as I have my faculties. Mm -hmm. And I always think that's why I didn't drink and I didn't do drugs because I want to be able to be cognizant of what I'm choosing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I could be anywhere because I put up a you know I fixed you know put up a little put up a little wall around the place in a certain section so I could go out and look at nature. Mm -hmm. That's what they do in River Oaks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be where you gotta be. Be what you, you know. But if I don't look down on people who move out because I like nice things. I love nice things. And one day I might, before I leave here, build me a nice house so I can say, well, I did do that while I was there. But right now we got work to do. 
We, we got really children do. to love. And I'm going to tell you something. And I want to tell this little secret so those who have problems with kids, when kids get to screaming and get out of control, and I have seen some of that, I call them to me. I have to bring them to my room. I get on my knees, look them in the eye. I said, you don't want nobody to see you looking like that. I said, now let's breathe. I said, I'm going to breathe with you. You can't holler and scream and breathe. They get to breathing, get to feeling better. And the thing that brings tears to my eyes is one little boy that they give him when he gets a rough time because he's kind of, he, he's bang. And uh, I did that to him. And when he got ready to leave to go home, he came into my room and gave me a hug. You can't put a dollar bill on that. Mm -hmm. can't put a dollar on it. And so I'm going to get my Goosens books out. And it's last publisher. I've, I've got it all now where I can probably do the Amazon. I'll get somebody and I'm going to get my. But the stories are going to be gotten out. Because the first one talks about our culture and our history from Africa and, and where we came from and who we really are. And the second one says, you know, because somebody say you something, you don't have to be that. But don't forget where you came from. And don't forget the people that help you. And don't forget your grandmother, your father, and all this different stuff. Because this boy ended up being uh, with his grandparents. And the next story I, I do, his parents will be found. Mm. But as a people, we have got to look out. And I tell people, if you're living in a neighborhood, if you're listening to me, and they're children, and you haven't connected with some child in some kind of way, you're missing out on something. Find a child to help. Yeah. Find a child to help. I had people to buy things for me when I was a kid. And who they used to, one couple, the one I used to clean for, they used to drink on the weekends and fuss and carry on. I have never forgotten their name. And when I think of them, a smile come across my face. And I know some people had education and money, and I don't even think, don't even know their name, don't even think about them. These people set up a situation where they took me into Pasadena where, you know, it was segregated, really segregated. And I was supposed to be getting things for their little niece. And I picked out everything I thought she would like, but I didn't want to pick out the black baby doll patent leather bow top shoes because I'd always wanted some and that was like too hard. But I remember a story my father told me and I selected the shoes for the little girl because of that story. And about when we got back home, I went in the closet and I was crying and they knocked on the door. Everything I had picked out, they had bought for me. Because I knew I wasn't getting anything for Easter. You don't think that those people uh, not at the top of my list, and if they had family or children, I would do anything I could for them because they left me with something that helped me to help other children. You know, buying kids clothes and doing mm -hmm. things for kids. It, 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 it gave that to me. And so someone once said, well, you always want to be doing something and helping people. Why do you do that? I say, I gave because I've been given to. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you bring up a great point as we close. Um, you know, with this being Black History Month, you talked about something that I actually wrote about uh, this week, mm -hmm. um, and that is the things that you can do yeah. to, uh, as an Af as an African American, well anyone, uh, regardless of your race, but you know, definitely as African Americans, uh, as a people that we, we should do, and one of them is actually, like you say, connecting with a, a young person, not not just your your child. I mean, that's you know, of course, definitely you want to connect with your child, mm -hmm. child or your children. That's a, 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 a but but you know, expand your uh, horizon yes. and, and, and reach out to right. somebody to uh, incorporate like a, a young person that you can uh, serve as a mentor mm -hmm. and teach them something about Black history. Yeah. If we're in the midst of Black History Month, let not you be the only person that knows a black history fact or a black history piece of information. We need to educate them. Another thing I'm encouraging people to do is actually find some sort of a, 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 a black history museum or some sort of a, a organization uh, that you can go visit. Shape uh, is a good one. Shape Are Community all those pictures Center. on the wall? My God, you got history, Shape history. Shape Community <laughs> Center right here in Houston. Uh, you have uh, the, Houston, uh, the African American, uh, uh, Houston Museum. Museum of African American Culture. Uh, in buff, uh, you and you have the collective that. with artists from yeah. all over the place, but you know, yeah. so, so by there's, Michelle Barnes. We need you need to, to, to Google some of these uh, these things. You mentioned uh, the collective in, in yeah. on the 18th. You say again, yeah, what? on the 18th, I'll be speaking about uh, say two o'clock, but on the 25th, I'm going to be doing giving a full 
uh, conversation uh, at the collective with my art, and I'll have art from different eras. And when will this be? It'll be the 18th of this month. From what time to from what time? From 2 o'clock till 4. 2 o'clock to 4, and where is the collective The located? collective is located on, I think it's 401 San Jacinto. Yeah, 4100 San Jacinto. Okay, all right. So if you uh, have nothing going on on the 18th of February, go check her out. Two to and I'll be, actually my exhibit will be there from the 18th of February until the 18th of March. So you can go in and look and see and, and, and check it out. But um, Yeah, so so then you have also, I would encourage everybody to, to uh, try to schedule. You don't have to go this month during Black History Month, but during Black History Month, schedule a, a trip to try to go visit the uh, National Smithsonian. Uh, Museum of African American Culture uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing uh, museum of, of rich black history. And it goes from, uh, again, you know, not just us being uh, an enslaved people, uh, you know, our history prior to slavery, uh, as well as, or excuse me, enslavement, and also, uh, you know, the, the gains that we made. But it also talks about, like I said, that history of ours, good. Bad and yeah, it's all supposed to be there. You just don't want to dwell on what's going to take you down, and you want to really dwell on what's going to bring you up. And that yeah. means we have got to become more solution oriented because pointing fingers out doesn't do us any good. I mean, we know we, we need to know where it is, but we need to know how to get away from it. Yeah. I'm going to have had a book on me, and I'm going to leave this book with you okay. so you can read more about me and my life. Okay. Uh, all right, yeah, that's so much. And that that particular the painting is about broken spirit. yeah, it's the painting is about four by five feet. And I'm gonna tell you, I painted it five years before I wrote the book and didn't know why I painted it. And I'm thinking, why am I painting all this stuff? I mean, I don't mm -hmm. I don't do collages that much, and it was all kind of. But then after I painted it, and when the when the Buddha told me that the name of the book, he named it. I said, he, he says, you got a book inside of you. I say, I'm writing on a book. It's the answer is love. He says, yeah, but the title is going to be the healing of a broken spirit. Mm. And it's resonated with me because I've been healing broken spirits all my life in the sense of you always have to go and look at things and, and start undoing and, rem and mending and putting back together because that's who we are as a people. And we know how to do it better than anybody. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the book. I want to encourage everybody to go check out her work uh, for the month. Starting February 18th over at the Collective. Uh, what's that address one more time? It's 4100 San Jacinto. 4100 San Jacinto. Right there at, I think it's Cleveland. Go right check there. it out, y'all. And, of course, like I said, find a way to get engaged and involved. Go Google some stuff about black history. Find out more about it. Something that you probably don't already know of uh, people that have made major contributions in the history. Learn about them. Don't just Google it and just learn a few you know, uh, facts via a couple of sentences. Learn more about the lives of people that have made a major difference in the world uh, as a person of African descent in your history. This is your history. If you're an African American uh, person here uh, under the sound of my voice, under the sound of our voice, you are black history and the people that you're connected to, your ancestors are a part of black history. So it's important for us and you to make sure you embrace your black history and also engage in a way that you can improve your knowledge and improve your uh, familiarity with who you are, where you come from, and uh, who we are as a collective. So thank you so much for being on Real Talk Junkies on the day. I'm going to check out this book, and I want to encourage everybody to share the link. Uh, again, make sure you go visit forwardtimes.com. Check out the latest news for and about black people, and connect with me, jeffreyalboni.com, and pick up my latest book, don't argue with me. A no-nonsense approach <laughs> to the issues in the black community. All right, y'all, I'm out. Peace.